I went to the Korea's office. I was 18 years of age. Uh, pretty much went in and said, look, I want to join the best Welsh regiment. Who is it? And obviously this Welsh Guards crew recruiting sergeant said, it's the Welsh Guards, son. You come with me. Um, off I went to training. Uh, first phase, bird right. Second phase was up in, up in Catrick. You're sort of there on, on PT, which what you call sort of the most senior rank, really, because when you're on PT, it's, you know, what, what, what rank you are, you're in charge of that. Full unconscious and just like full 30 feet on their head. So he said, what do you want to do? And I was on the spot and I went, so I'll do the, I'll do, I'll do the P company. I'll do the P company parrot. He said, Melina, I suggest you about turn march out the office, come back in and give me the right answer. Hello, legends. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Sean Molino, who uh, founded the UK Veterans Awards. And is this the time where I get my... <laughs> I get my award out. Look, I'm the current... Uh, English Veteran of the Year for inspiration. And um, thank you ever so much for that, Sean. I have to say, mate, that was one hell of a good weekend. Um, I was just, I was walking on air, I have to say, coming back from that, uh, the, those awards. It was a good show. So thank you, mate. No, very, very, very well deserved. And I think that from the feel in the room, I know we're, we all, as the veteran community, we all sort of were supporting each other as well, which is what I like. You know, when it is, obviously everyone wants to win. We do all want to win in life. That's a life thing. I think. The majority of people out there want to win. They want to, they want to be up there. But I think for everyone that was just in the room as well, Chris, just to get through and, and have that experience and have the sort of promotion of being a finalist and being out there as well. I think that's, that's something to cherish, really, and that's something that we pride ourselves on. Trying to promote the community as a whole. Obviously, there can only be a, there can only be one winner, like they can if they're race. There's only one winner. Um, but ultimately, I think that the community as a whole it just spreads so much uh, positive light on the people who were doing great things. Obviously, including yourself. We had some great we had some great stories on the back of that night, and I think there was a fair bit of maybe alcohol drunk as well, and a few good stories and uh, yeah, <laughs> fantastic evening. <laughs> yes, and I must say, you know, a big big up to all. My all our fellow veterans there, some people doing some great stuff. Sean, let's come on and talk about that. But I, um, I just want to talk about your earlier career, which was Welsh Guards, PTI and the Welsh Guards, and one hell of a famous regiment, is it not? Yeah, you did call it the, the Queen, Queen's Finest back then, obviously the King's Finest now, God rest her soul. But um, I think, yeah, for me, I, I went to the Korea's office, I was 18 years of age, uh, Pretty much went in and said, look, I want to join the best Welsh regiment. Who is it? And obviously this Welsh Guards crew recruiting sergeant said, it's the Welsh Guards, son. You come with me. Um, off I went to training. Uh, first phase, bird right. Second phase was up in, up in Catrick. Uh, so plenty of hills. Passed out of training, obviously. Uh, very proud. Um, and I remember getting off the train station in St. James's Park, which is, I don't know if you know London very well, everyone, but it's it's, it's near enough to sort of Buckingham Palace and Wellington yeah, Barracks. Yeah. And, and so I remember getting off there and uh, obviously guarding the Queen then for the first sort of year, year of my military career in, in, in Welcome Barracks, living literally a stone so away from, from Buckingham Palace. So it was a bit of an eye-opener for a young Welsh lad who comes from a small town. Obviously living in London at the age of 18, it was plenty of nights out and good fun stories. But yeah, that was the first part. And um, yeah, very proud, really. And within, within a year, I was always very fit because I did a lot of martial arts and a bit of rugby in school. Um, and to be honest, with the age of 19, I was put on for my PTI course, which is very, very fast. Uh, it's very fast to be loaded onto that. It's usually about a year and a half, two years before anyone would be sort of loaded onto one of those courses. But I think it's because I was always, always at the front, always, you know, pushing, trying to better myself. I, I was at the front with the PTIs running all the time. So that's when I went across to the Army School of Physical Training. It was actually a book neck, Royal Marine Instructor. So a guy called uh, Tony Hans. I don't know if you've come across him, Chris, at any point, but Staff Hans, Tony Hans, he was my... Uh, I tried to. Yes, I tried to avoid him, mate. <laughs> <laughs> we call nods nods in training, right? And um, when you're a nod, you kind of need a PTI who's a bit older than you because you, you. I mean, every, all, all your training teams a bit battle hardened and a bit old, older than you. And a, at 19, I bet you had recruits that were older than than you, Sean, didn't you? Uh, well, there was, there was. I think that was a bit of a sort of for a while. It was weird because I was in. I think after about a year and a half as well, I went to quite a senior platoon. So it was I was in guns and snipers. 
So it wasn't just a sort of rifle platoon. They started off with five platoon and then went across the with big, big machine guns for those who are not in the military, like GPMGs and things. And obviously the snipers, we were, we were a separate platoon attached to number two company. You have to sort of earn the respect of it as well then. I can rem- I can actually remember it because it was a lot of senior, senior bods, you know, been in, you know, eight years, eight years sort of uh, guardsmen. Uh, and then you're, you're sort of there on, on PT, which were you call sort of the most senior rank really, because when you're on PT, it's, you know, what, what, what rank you are, you're in charge of that session, you're in charge of that training programme. So it was a bit, and I think, you know, for the first sort of six months, it took me a bit of time to find my feet. But what it did hold me in good stead for was when I went for my promotion card and then with um, the Household Division and, and Parachute Regiment. For those who don't know, that that's the sort of guards and the paras. Um, they come together for their sort of junior NCO card there. Uh, and they do it in a, in, in a place called HDRPCC, Household Division of Parachute Regiment Centre Courses, in Purbright. So we do it together. Um, and it had me in great good stead doing that PTI course earlier. I, I came off that course with a distinction. Uh, so it was one of the top t- top grades on that. Um, but I think that was very much because I'd done my PTI course and I was in a leadership role slightly before going on mm-hmm. to my junior NCO card, if that makes sense, Chris. But um, I, I really, really appreciate that. At the time, I didn't, I don't think, because I was a young lad. I was probably interested in things that most squaddies and soldiers are interested in, going out drinking and doing the usual jazz. But when I look back and I self-reflect, and I do a lot of that though, Walter, that, that was the first sort of good management course that I ever done. Uh, and, and I really hold that now, you know, quite sort of dear to my heart, that that sort of put me on my track of, of being management. And, and when we come to transition, you know, they're good points that you can pick from as well. But no, um, some, some you know, great times, great times. Not so much during training, but on the potential recruits course. So the course, the three day course you yeah. have to do to get into the Marines. Yeah. You'd get like lads, they climb the top of the 30 foot rope, fall unconscious and just like fall 30 feet on their head. <laughs> and it's like, fuck off, son, get on the train. <laughs> and, it, and it is, it really is like that. It's, there's no, the Marines are really nice people. They just generally tend to be really good lads, but they've got this thing where they don't, there's no love loss for fools. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, I'm sure it's the same in the guards. Um, it's not like they're uncaring. It's just, when I was in training, um, I was I went up to the hot plate to get, you know, to get me scran, the food what you call scoff, right? Yeah, the set scoff, yeah. The chap in front of me was a potential recruit. So he's, and and they just, you could spot them a mile away. They looked like they'd just come out of, I don't know, off the dole queue or something. (laughs) And this chap had long hair. So he, He's there in a eat in a dining room with I don't know three hundred blokes all with their hair not just short but like as short as we yeah. were allowed to you know short back and side sort of thing all these chefs looking smart and Royal Marine chefs don't really have that many now but back then they were the best in the world you know this lads at the hot plate <laughs> and um and the chef just looked at me and went did you want some chicken my darling. Like it's just, just just purposely fucking winding this <laughs> little lads look. Sorry, Sean, going off on That's one, but, right. um, but I think that that, that that sort of stipulates the banter, and I think wherever forces you're in, that you know the wind up, the banter, and that that sort of sort of. Uh, and I think that's something that people miss when they leave at some point, you know, because you don't, I don't think you'll ever get what we had, uh, whatever you're in. You know, with the Marines, I've got great, great Marine mates, really good friends, uh, some real great, uh, great mates, still obviously in, in the Army, the Air Force, the Navy. But that banter side of it, I think, is, is brilliant, class. So did you get what, – what I was getting at is do you get a – you know, you must have seen some things as a PTI. You must have seen people crash out on runs and stuff. Oh, you know – we were very, we were very, very fit. When we moved from uh, Wellington Barracks, and come off ceremonial duties, we moved to all the shots, uh, and we were, we were, we were super fit at that point. It's two company. Uh, we had a um, oh god, he's Major General Stamford just finished as Major General Stamford, um, and we had a uh, company star Major Bowen. So they were my sort of company commander, company star major, but they 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 drilled us to, to bits. So on 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 a Friday. Um, was in charge of sort of COs P- PT. We'd be doing the eight miles. So it was eight miles CFT. It's slightly probably changed now. I think some of it's changed, you know, in the last couple of years. But um, we'd always do an eight mile CFT. Our aim would be to do it in one hour 45 with full kit on. Um, so it was a bit of a skip, you know, and if, if people weren't 
you know, putting their weight on that, they'd pretty much find themselves on Barricade or on gate duty over the weekend. So it was quite, you know, it, it was tough. But that, that would be every sort of Friday before we knock off. We'd have our usual fit sessions through the week, you know, jet runs and, and circuit training. But we'd always do a heavy loaded carry every Friday before we knocked off on, on the weekend, sort of COs, COs PT. And, uh, but yeah, we, we've seen a lot. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of lads that, uh, that, that did cream in, but it's, it's tough, you know, uh, and fizz was tough. And then the idea was to be to get everyone to the stage that they're not dropping back, if that makes sense. So if they were dropping back, we then look at things to try and put that in place. Because ultimately as a, as a PTI, we, we don't want them dropping back, do we? We want everybody to be at the front and everybody to be able to do it in a 145 comfortable pace, even though we're sort of CFT officially on the books was so between 155 and two hours. We'd like to sort of aim to be coming in 10, 15 minutes before that because we've seen ourselves as, you know, we want to be the, the best, if that makes sense. We want to be one of the best regiments out there, both fighting-wise and also and also fitness-wise as well. We'll give the Falklands a mention because that's one of the reasons that the guards were sent sent down south, wasn't it? It was their... Um, their their ability to march i get lads message me chris i want to join the marines what should i you know should i be running with boots and when i'm like no <laughs> i said first off i didn't do no training before i joined up <laughs> don't think a lot of this i think quite a lot of blokes are like me i i did a few like four milers but nothing you know i was always kind of good at the ropes and stuff and the climbing and the, yeah. and the, and the, we call it USMC the the like the press press ups and all that sort yeah. of stuff um but i say to these lads no you what you want to do is enjoy enjoy it enjoy your running get your walkman on go out you know get good at running 4 milers you don't want to mm -hmm. you don't need to be doing like marathons mm -hmm. with boots and kit that's just 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 get all round general fitness and then the marines will take you from there that's what that's what training is for and then the other thing because there's a lot of rope work in the marines is i say learn to climb a rope that will save you mm -hmm. especially if you're a tall person carrying a bit of weight that that will just save you in training you you watch lad sean and They'd be, they, they'd be in torture because they fall behind. They just can't get up that rope, you know? Um, so I'll tell the lads, look, get the B&Q, buy 30 foot of rope, and go go out the yeah. forest and tie it up to a tree, just practice climbing it. Um, what 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 would you say to um, to youngsters who wanted to join the guards? Yeah, well, I mean, I had a chat with a young lad yesterday. He was actually speaking at Andarsi Academy of Sport where the Ospreys trained and there was a young gentleman on a sports course. Um, I do a little bit of talking on entrepreneurship and setting up business to do with Forces Fitness, the company I set up. But um, so he wants to join the Welsh Guards, actually, and he's going through the process now. So I, I popped in my card. I said, look, send him a send me a, send me a sort of an email. I'll put a little program together for him. So look, this is what I would do. But running is, is, is fundamentally key. It is key. Uh, it works your heart and lens. I think the old press-ups, sit-ups, again, we does not break away from the, you know, the traditional exercises, which are basic, which you would do on your potential Royal Marines course, so you do your press ups, sit ups, you do your heaves and you do your run, don't you? I think those mm -hmm. those tests on that now, which again, I'm taking some recruits through that tomorrow uh, in another college and putting them through that potential test to see how they come out on it. So yeah, running definitely, I would like to put in, if if, if they could, because um, the runs have changed slightly now in the entrance, I think it's, um, it's like a 2K run, but run off a mile and a half, it doesn't hurt. Fart leg training, it's always good, bit of interval type training. You know, work on a 400 meter sprint, walk 400, 400 meter sprint, walk 400, steady state 2K, steady state two, two and a half, two, uh, two, um, mile and a half. And again, going up to 5K, I think really you're right in what you're saying. You don't need to be running any longer than that. At tops, I'd say, you know, 5K probably before you get into training. And if you can do a good 5K time, somewhere between sort of 20 minutes and 24 minutes you know i think that would be all right because they'll take you through it they do take you through it they don't just do you know, when you go to training then you're, it's not just use a 55 pound burger and get your boots on and we'll go for 20 miles that doesn't happen as you know they, they do take you through the stage and, and the course is built for that but having a basic all-round fitness level of making sure that you can do a decent amount of press-ups um and if you can obviously you can get the raw marines sort of uh assessment test the deep test that's a good one because it's a good gauge you can do from home um, you can set up a 20 meter uh, cones. You can do it yourself, you know, so I give it a go and, and have use that as a gauge. I think you want to be somewhere, I think, in the army before they go into training, level nine and above before you sort of go into training. 
I think when you get in there, it used to be sort of level 10. I'm pretty sure the Royal Marines is at sort of level 11, I think, is what they're aiming for. Um, but they, they give you some sort of guidance on that. But yeah, definitely, there's tools out there. Press-ups, sit-ups, basic core exercises, and, and, and concentrate on your running. Work those heart and lungs. Did you, did you mention a para course there, or did I mishear you? So what happens with uh, so the guards and paras, they do their course together. So um, it's called the Household Division, which are the, the foot guard regiments, so Coldstream and Grands, uh, and then you've got the, the parachute regiments, which is one, two, and three para. We come together to do our corporal's course. Um, ah, okay. So I had, so I had, I had two, two, two para DS on my course, mm. uh, Badger Bailey. Um, I can't remember the gentleman's name. Sorry if you're listening. Uh, but anyway, they, they, I, I was on that course. I came off the distinction. Um, on, on the course, there were top yeah. students on it, which was great. And, and at that point, I mean, the commanding officer was, was guards, para, Irish guards, but para badged. Um, he asked me to do a selection at that point. But uh, I think I walked in the office and sort of banged it for salute. He said, you know, guards and Molino, you're fantastic, well done. I think you should think about going to selection. I think I, I think he said to him, selection, for those who don't know, is going for sort of the SAS or the SBS, Special Air Service, Special Forces. So at that point, I was like, I'll have a think about it, sir. But I, I, I remember walking outside, Back then, I smoked. I don't know. It's a duty habit. I think it sparked up a cigarette, and I was thinking, that guy's mad. There's no chance ever that I'm ever going to do that. They were far too keen. That, that was too keen for me. I was a, I was a squaddy. I loved sort of a bit of the soldier when I was doing it, but I also loved my weekends, going out partying and going out clubbing and getting, you know, chasing down women or whatever we were doing. Do you know what I mean? It was just, that was my sort of, I was a young lad, you know? I was, I was 20, what was I, 21? 21 on my corporal's course, you know, 19 doing my PDI course. So still pretty young, really, with all of that in that age, but I was far too interested in that side of it. Mm. Did you get many, um, did many chaps in your regiment get their wings? Did you, did you get like allocated a certain number? Did you need it for like recce troop and this sort of stuff? So, so what happens with the guards? The guards are one of the, the only sort of um, battalions that have a presence within three para. So they've actually got a guards parachute platoon. So um, the people have got the opportunity to go and do their wings. Then they'll get attached to 16 Air Assault Brigade and the three para, but they're actually badged up guards, uh, guards sort of flash with uh, the, 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 the parachute regiment insignia on there. So um, there is the opportunity to do that if you wish, if, if, if you wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. um, there was an opportunity for me to do it at the same time as, as doing my PTI course. And the company, this was when I was getting 19, um, and the company saw Major Bow, and I can remember it to this day. I'm glad he actually said no, and, and I ended up PDI course. But I marched in, and he said, Molino, you've got a choice to make. You can go on your parachute regiment course and you know attempt to go for that and go off the three para, or you can do your PTI course with a battalion. So he said, What do you want to do? And I was on the spot, and I went, oh, So I'll do the, I'll do, I'll do the P company. I'll do the P company para. He said, Molino, I suggest you about turn, march out the office, come back in, and give me the right answer. So, so I'm actually having a little PDI course to it. He said, well done. But because of that, and I know this sounds so crazy, my whole business was built around that PDI course. So that one moment in my life where I was thinking, oh, well, I, I fancy doing that, but didn't want to rock the boat because I was pretty much a young sort of crow. Um, that, you know, that moment really, and me setting up a business in physical training that runs across the whole of Wales and, and, and multiple places within England was maybe because of that moment as well. Does that make sense? Anyway, again, if I'd have done my MP company, I might have gone off the P company, not been one of the fittest in, the, in that in that platoon because it would have been a lot, you know, a lot fitter than and three power. Don't get me wrong, they're going to have some fit lads in there. It may not have been a PTI and I may not have ended up doing what I'm doing now. So I'm a big believer, Chris, and things happen for a reason in life. And uh, I, I, I do believe, I do believe that. Yeah, I think the secret in life, Sean, is A, try and get as much done as you can. So you, you, you know, I've done enough now that if I literally didn't do anything again for the next, I don't know how many years I've got, you know, sat in a jack chair on a bit, I, 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 I'm, I'm happy. You know, I, I genuinely, okay, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But so that's what I'd say to anyone, you know, get out there, smash as much as you can. But the secret in life is knowing when to, if you fail or something doesn't work out or it's not for you or you don't get picked, you got to let that go. Leave mm -hmm. that's, you know, and veterans have a real, cause veterans tend to live in their egos or their identity. I should say, as I'm, a, I'm, a, well, it's not even so much veterans. Actually, it's more, I get a lot, Sean, of people that tried to get in the forces, but didn't get in. It's sad, mate, that people will carry that their whole life. Yeah. And and into adulthood, they're still broken by it. And I'm like, dude, 
let a sports meant yeah. to be let you get you one life yeah. Yeah. one life and you you're carrying this millstone about a job if you did it you probably know most of it was shit. <laughs> like there's good times and bad times, Chris. I think that's what we have in there. But most people only remember the good when they get out. But there's a reason a lot of people get out at some point. Yeah. That makes sense. You know, uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I believe in what you're saying. I think do things that make you smile is, is massive for me because that has a positive effect. But don't don't be afraid of failure and don't linger on it either. I think you've yeah. got to give yourself another clear vision and set goals for another target, something that's going to make you feel happy. Mm. I think that's and that's I think about having a positive mindset and I think that's something that I really thrive and you know try and instill in any of my learners or talks that I give is keeping that positive mindset keeping that good vision of where you want to get to you can't blame people Sean because it's like you say as vet as veterans especially when you get together or you do podcasts like this you know you do chat about the good times don't you 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 mm. you remember the good you remember the funny and to people to outsiders it must just sound like being in the military is brilliant. They don't know that, no, 85% of the time you're bored off your ass, you want to go home for the weekend, you're yeah. sat in an office waiting for some sergeant who ain't got the guts to go, all right, lads, oh. knock off early. <laughs> and, you know, because he's worried about what the troop boss will say if he gets... Yeah. And, and it's quite funny. I hold a, a reunion every year. <laughs> my mate Ed come down. We were on ship together, me and Ed, a great bloke. And um, we... We met at this reunion. We sat having a pint. And he just looked and went, in it. <laughs> I said, what's that? He said, the f Marines. Do you remember the hours we spent saying how shit it was? <laughs> <laughs> and yet we'll all meet up <laughs> to remember it. <laughs> Mm. Yes, quite quite funny, quite funny. Um, did you mention sniper, Sean? Or did, uh... So I was in guns and snipers. So I, I wasn't a sniper myself, so I was a machine gunner. But the guns and snipers back then, I think mean, I know the roles and platoons have changed. We used to have um, in, in uh, sort of Prince of Wales Company, which were all the tall lads, because in the guards you go with height order. Tall lads are used to be Prince of Wales Company. I was two companies, so I was six foot, so the middle lads. And then you had the sort of little iron men, the small ones, and three company. But in, in, in Prince of Wales and two company, we had a platoon which was um, made up of guns and snipers. So we tend, it was called Manuba Support Platoon. So we tended to do a lot of work um, together, basically, uh, almost away from the rifle company. We had our own sort of classroom. We'd done our own fizz. And it was it was quite nice. It was it was a nice platoon to be in. There were a lot more uh, potentially the sort of the senior sort of soldiers were in there who'd been around a little bit. Um, but I'm, I'm treated a little bit more, a little bit more, I'd say, like adults. Uh, so mm -hmm. we give a little bit more responsibility and stuff. Um, but it was it was it was good. I, I really enjoyed that. The guns MS too. I speak, I speak to a lot of the lads who are still in now. Um, a lot of them are commissioned, but they'll they'll say, look, you know, that was the best sign being back then. Maneuver support platoon going on uh, uh, up tag up to Canada, then deploying to Bosnia and stuff. But they, that was the sort of nice a nice period. If that makes sense. Was that GPMG or was that uh, yeah gun? GPMG? I was on yeah GPMG. I was a GPMG gunner, so obviously number two, one and two in sustained fire role, which is sort of like the tripods. Uh, yeah. number, number one and number two gunner. Friends, you fire the GPMG, and it's just got a general purpose tripod on the front. Well, it's a, I think it's a bipod, Sean, isn't yeah. it? Is it? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, it's a bipod. So yeah. two legs swing down, and yeah. you can lay it on the ground in front of you, and, and off you go, and it's wonderful to fire in that role because you can feel the whole mm. weapon going ka -jung, ka -jung, ka -jung, ka -jung. it's it's i don't know i'm just i'm a bit funny about i like i like i like that sean i used to like the submachine gun because again you could feel the mechanism in it yeah. it's like the old yeah. spring going yeah <laughs> it wouldn't i think the down. smell of the brass as well when you're firing it in sort of sustained fire which is when it's on the big the big tripod uh, yes. That's when you with when that's going down the range in 20, 30 round bursts, it's like that's that's you know you, you do some damage with that, especially on a night shoot. You watch those sort of lit, lit, lit up tracer rounds hitting the target and bouncing off the target. That's when you've got a full gun line going as well, and maybe five or six guns, and they're all just smashing the fire, and that's brilliant. So you said it. So SF roll, sustained fire roll, folks. Yeah. Is you take the butt off. You've just got the sh shorter weapon and it sits on this real solid tripod that's not going anywhere, right? And then you dial it in, Sean, don't you? It's got the tripod, yeah. it's got dials on, so you can dial the weapon around. And we saw it in training for the first time, Sean, and the training team, the tracer, were pinging off this rock about 
is about two mile away. Yeah, yeah, it's about right, yeah. And they could just pick out this tiny little rock and they was hitting it and the tracer was just going straight up in the air, straight up in the air. It was it was insane. What um did you ever have a runaway gun? That has happened before. Yeah, people have had a runaway gun with the belts. That has happened. Not personally to me, but I've seen it happen on the range, but not personally, that's happened. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously, and obviously, barrel changes need to be quite frequent. Otherwise, you could end up with a bendy barrel, which I guess if you fire too many rounds to it. Again, forgive me, it was a long time ago. I want to say it's, I want to say it's like a 400 round change, maybe, but some are maybe on the thing you say slightly less. But you've got to change the barrel frequently. Otherwise, they glow luminous. Luminous, luminous, then they end up being white, bright red, white, and then they get all look a bit floppy, which isn't good there. And you've got to be careful when you put it down the grass, because that's happened before. They've said a barrel change, put it on the grass. The next thing you know, a fire's happened because <laughs> the, the dead grass has got it next to you. <laughs> yes, yes, we we put we did a section attack in training. And it was all, you know, all exciting. It was in the summer, so it was good weather. I think it was a moonless night uh, it might have been a little bit of moon but it was you know that that feeling where it feels like you're doing it for real yeah and and literally just as the enemy uh, our enemy spotted us and they their their machine guns kicked into life so the umpire's like right stop because we one of the schmoolies had come down and caught fire to the bloody woodbury common <laughs> I think it was a shmooly. It might it might have been something, and um, the we had to we had to then put this uh, put this fire with your paddles out. with your paddles. Was it with the, with the, with the Peter paddles? Was it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was something called cooking off, wasn't there? Where the barrel got so hot, the round would go off that yeah. you didn't even have to pull the trigger. It yeah. could it could initiate itself. Was it or or just could the round? Off. Yeah, again, yeah. Uh, again, hasn't happened to me thankfully, but it, I, I've. You know, we've seen it sort of happen or heard it happen with cook off. Yeah, the sort of round just swells and then obviously you just get your top covered down quickly if you see that happening underneath and then, and then off it goes. Could be also some people may see it as an ND as well. So it's quite close borderline really to be in cook off. And then you're like, oh no, it was definitely a cook off. I didn't touch the trigger. Um, but I think I think that that's understandable with the guns that does happen as well. Mm. Did you deploy on at yeah. did you mention Bosnia then? And a few different ops. So I think when we went to Bosnia, um, Went out to Bosnia, done some operations out in Bosnia, um, former Yugoslavia. That was in the, that was a summer tour, so it was quite hot out there. I know like, the food being in the Balkans, it's usually quite hot in the summer, and it can be quite tastily cold with a lot of snow in the winter out there. Um, so again, when we were out there, more or less sort of hard, sort of heart and minds a bit really, doing a lot of house searches for illegal stored weapons, just patrolling the general area, and uh, um, that was with NATO. Um, and then did you, from, did you from, see any? I mean, there was a lot of atrocities in that part of the world, wasn't it? Not so much when I was there. I think that the, the, the biggest thing there was uh, that would have been a couple of years previous. We were sort of stabilization forces there, rather the initial forces that went in that would have picked up on a lot of that. Loads of minefields still out there, loads of that. I think that the worst thing I think that had happened was uh, we had a grenade thrown over the Rebro Center at one point in one of the Rebros we were in. Um, no contact, though, no contact in relation to sort of, you know, getting shot at, if that makes sense, directly. Uh, it was more, we were in a role where we were sort of, sort of policing the area. It was in the north in Banja Luka, so it was the Serb control part of Bosnia, because it's sort of split into two, I think. I still think it is, but you'd have the Serb control top half, and then you have the sort of, uh, the sort of uh, Croatian sort of controlled, sort of bottom half still, where they were sort of living in separate areas. Um, so we were up in the Serb area. So it was mainly house searches for weapons, and the boys dug up loads of weapons, to be fair. I think they went into one barn. There was like a big anti, anti-aircraft anti gun in a barn, in a farmer's barn. So there was loads of weapons getting confiscated off some little old lady answered the door and said, oh, no, there's nothing here. Went out to the barn, there's a big anti-aircraft gun in there. But there's some good stories, and it was, it, was a, it was a nice, it was quite a nice tour. I know that might sound bad, bad but it was... It, was, it wasn't a, an overly bad tour. When I look at some of the sort of op, Optelic, which is the Iraqs, and, and definitely the, the later Herod tours, which are very, very heavy on all my friends who I spoke to, um, it, was a, it, was, it, was, it was not a bad tour. Does that make sense? It was, mm. it was a decent tour to do. Um, Could you imagine it, if, they, if they sent the boys and girls into bloody Ukraine, the bloodbath that we're going to... It is a different... You know, the technology, Sean, has moved on so much... They can see you when you can't even see anything in the sky. They're watching you. They know exactly what, 
you know your enemy know exactly where you are they can just bring in the i don't know 500 pounders on your position it's it's um yeah it's a changing theater isn't it well, well, I think that's why the army's changed. And if you look at the sort of these new ranger regiments or whatever they're bringing in, and it's operated very much in a sort of special forces type role, smaller teams. I think the, the days of getting up and doing large, massive scale company uh, company attacks, mm. you know, when they're sort of digging in, I think that think that I can't see that happening that much. Uh, I know, I know it's happening a little bit in Ukraine with frontline the trenches, but generally, I think warfare's changed so much now and, and that's why the, the army and, and the armed forces are mobilized these sort of smaller in and out teams they're training with drones now to work alongside drones to guide them into positions and i think that that's the future um i think that is the future of technology because you've got so much now you've got the large-scale drones about you so much can ping you and there's so many weapon systems that can drop these missiles you know from m- miles and miles and miles away you won't, again you won't see them come in so um yeah the old school traditional wolf and it's moved on over the years hasn't it you look at it, you look back to the old wars, it was just marching forward and just getting shot at World War One to World War Two. So it's generally progressing more towards wars that are going to be won with technology, although you will need manpower on the ground at some point, of course. If you think about it, the commandos that say went 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 behind the lines in the Second World War were the the original commandos. They didn't have to worry about a drone with an infrared mm. cam- camera on it above their head. They didn't have to worry about even a starlight scope, which is probably that's like old. That's like night night. That was the original night vision site, yeah. folks. We mm-hmm. have one in. We have one with us in Belfast, and um, it was funny. I remember my mate just tapped me on the shoulder, and went, "Look at this," and he handed me his rifle. There was a couple folks outside a pub. I think you can guess what they would. Do doing thinking that they was in the dark <laughs> not knowing they had a, a whole multiple of mar- marines like in the same alleyway um but like we could be really roughy tufty back then you know with the dagger in the teeth sneaking around and camouflage it's not like that now you know you you physically cannot do that i mean you can do that kind of warfare but you've always got to be prepared. If a drone goes over, you're pinged. And then yeah. some some spotty teenager in a in a bloody porter cabin in in bloody Idaho or somewhere just goes, oh, mm. good night. It's 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 crazy, Sean. How much? And I think youngsters still live under the delusion that that's what soldiering is. You know, they think the Second World War stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think I think there's elements to it as well. I think I think there maybe you might get away with the old traditional stuff in, in in like a country that's you know that's very poor and hasn't got technology definitely. But if you're looking at sort of like you know majority the the sort of westernized or the big countries in Russia, China, all them have got a, a fantastic technology, maybe far more advanced than us. I, I don't know, I'm not not not, 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 not techy, but some of the smaller countries you may well get away with it in a country that's you know hasn't got that sort of technical advance but you're right it's it's very rare and i think it's it's changing it's a shame to see everything shrink so much i think when i joined the army there was 125,000 british armed british um army troops i think we're down to 70 odd thousand now uh 73,000 i'm sure the marines have shrunk a bit as well chris is it i'll be honest mate i actually don't know it used to be um all the time i was in i think we used to have about 8,000 in total actually sounds like a lot now um, but in total, they used to say the size of a sort of football stadium. Uh, um, we're talking like Plymouth football stadium, yeah. not not like Liverpool or somewhere. Yeah. Did you see active service anywhere else? So, so my service um, with the Welsh Guards was Bosnia, and then when we come back from uh, from Bosnia, we went straight off to Fresco, which is the fire strike. So that was interesting because all our leave got cancelled. So I felt for the guys who would come back off operations recently, had to do the same. I think that was hard work covering the strikes. Um, so we covered them, and then we went rapid did, response to Northern Ireland. Did you have to put any fires out? Yeah, yeah, we done a few fires, not loads. We done a few. Well, fires, did you though. did did you start them? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we did a few fires. We did a few fires. There was a few like uh, there was a couple of fires in our area. We were based up in Coventry, so up in the, up in the Midlands, uh, and it was all right. You know, we had, 
it, it was not a bad job, but it was just the timing. If you want, you've just done a six month tour, we wanted to go and leave to us, see our family and our kids and everything coming back. And they were like, all leaves cancelled. Off, you know, we go up the Coventry. So I think they were, you were a little bit peed off, I probably is the word, really. That is um, literally sent to Coventry. <laughs> yeah, no, it wasn't. It, no, it wasn't. It was, uh, I remember Radford Road, you know, we were out at Radford Road TA Centre. That's where we were based. We what did you, did you have, like, was it the Green Goddesses that you used to have in the 70s? I was the only one that had a red engine. So I was a red engine commander, but everyone else had Green Goddesses. So I felt like a privilege for that, which was quite nice. Um, so yeah, I, I had I had one red engine, which I don't know where they got that from. It's probably from some army barracks or RAF station that we managed to get hold of. But everyone else had the green goddesses, which did break down. Uh, you know, they, they, they at max they were sort of going fifty miles per hour top end with with the foot down sort of job. But I think they still got them somewhere mothball just in case anything happens again. Mad. When I went on ship, we had to do the um, C five heighting course. All the like I'm sure that you probably did the breathing apparatus yeah, and stuff, bars. right? Yeah, the bar treatment, yeah. Yeah. We had to put, I don't know, what's it like, a big, almost like an asbestos suit on or something and your, and your, your, the hoodie and then your, your respirator or your breathing apparatus and they send you into this part of an old ship. It's just black, Sean, you know, mm. filled with smoke and you got to obviously stay down and creep up on a fire and put it. It was, it was I just remember that was... um really fascinating to do that course you know it was i think it was i think from my perspective again looking back it was pretty much everyone was purging the moment but then looking back i think well you know it's been all right we've sort of been a fireman for a little bit it's another thing that you sort of done in life because you, you know you look back then and again like we said earlier you look back at the positives i tend to anyway i tend to look back at the positives, that's me but i bet you know I, I do also remember the time that and the feeling the effect it had on a lot of people you know i was fairly young um, you know, I had a, a young child myself, but there's like some of the lads there who obviously got three or four children, want to get home to their wives, and they're all of a sudden stuck up there for for a couple of weeks or so again before we can get back home. But again, I look back and it was nice. It was nice to have done that. Um, I think after Radford Road, then after we finished the fire strikes, we moved to St Athens, which was lovely because obviously you can tell from my accent of Welsh. Um, and St Athens camp is uh, 10, 15 minutes away from my house, so. That was our last post, and we were rapid response then for Northern Ireland. So we were based in in London Derry, um, and, and literally that that was a again that was an interesting tour because on that tour I think it was number three company intercepted a bomb on the River Foyle that was three times bigger than the Omar bomb, uh, and it got it got it got a flash in the pan news. But if you go onto it and Google search, you can Google search it. I think it was the biggest bomb ever to have been found on main, in in mainland Europe. Um, three times bigger than the other, but it got literally. And in, and in other where, news, where was it, mate? Um, do you know um, in London Derry you've got the River Foyle? Oh, it was over the war. Yeah, so yeah, in, yeah. up in Northern Ireland, London Derry, across across the bridge, they intercepted a bomb on there, and uh, it was three times bigger than the Omar bomb. Crazy, insane. But if that thing going off, you know, but mm. uh, that was good, and that was in, I'm going to say 2003. That was so coming towards sort of. It's always been quite volatile there. I think, you you know, we flick the news now, the terror state's gone up, but it's always got that potential to go off. I think most people there now, most people you speak to, because they've got family from Northern Ireland, you know, just want it all to end. But like everything, is, and, and everything in the world, there's going to be extremists somewhere uh, for whatever side you're looking at. There's always going to be those people that want to keep it going um, for whatever reason that may be. But I think people who are just fed up in Northern Ireland, to be honest with you, with what was happening. I mean, you served there, Chris, as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I had a chat with Kenny last night. Um, Kenny was um, King's Own Border Regiment and uh, he later joined Veterans for Peace. And he's a great, we've had some great chats, me and Ken. And I was saying to him last night, because they're saying it's flaring up over there, mm. but but they're also trying to push the Good Friday Agreement forward. So, you know, there's a, there was a film, Sean, called 50 Dead Men Walking, all about the the agents that were controlled over there like civilian you know people that were informing and and people that were being can um controlled by the british government and uh, right at the end of that film if i remember rightly they kind of hint that the ira was being controlled by london <laughs> i don't think it can flare up again sean oh simply because we live in a different society now you know, what are you going to do? Text Seamus on Facebook and tell him to 
like bring over to set. He, 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 I just think there's too much surveillance now. And, you know, again, even an eye in the sky, just, 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 we, we were like, we didn't have all that back in the eighties. Yeah. Mm. You, know, you had to physically rely on seeing someone. If, if it was dark, that was it. You couldn't see him unless, unless you had the starlight scope. Yeah. <laughs> Sean, have you met Simon Weston? Yes, I met Simon. So I met Simon at, um, we spoke at a military conference together. So Simon, I think, spoke first. Uh, and then I think I was on the same, uh, Colin McLaughlin, I spoke then, and then Colin McLaughlin spoke last. Mm. So, yeah, so I met Simon before, and I know he's he's heavily involved in, um, in a number of veterans' causes around Wales as well. So he, he's doing a good job, to be fair to him. Yes, he's a lovely bloke. He came on a podcast. Colin's come on a podcast. Yeah, he's Colin, a good yeah, Colin, very popular chap, you know. Nice he, t- he, t- he told us some hell of a funny stories. He said when he, um, oh, what was it? He he left he left the SAS and then he tried to join the reserves and they said, no, we're not having you. You've got flat feet. <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> this, is after, <laughs> this is after a glowing career in the SAS. <laughs> they wouldn't let, let him in the reserves. That's um, and we both had someone in common and a lot of, a lot of squaddies and Marines, I think, would say the same as we both didn't get any RAF. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't have us. <laughs> Falklands like mythology, Sean, is that was that still a big thing when you were in? We did you yeah. take a lot of lessons from it? Well, there was a lot of instru- there was a lot of instructors that would have come off the back of Falklands. So when I, I joined, so I joined in nineteen ninety nine for everybody to get a bit of a, an idea of when I joined. The Falklands was eighty two. So um, a lot of the, there were some Falklands soldiers coming towards the t- tail end. So I as you know, uh, Martin Miles coming there, eighty two, A Davis, um, uh, Fridge Coolin. So they, they were all sort of coming to the end of their careers, if that would make sense. But through training, it was talked about a lot, especially. Um, you know, the Scots Guard, Mount Tumble down, going on the bayonet training, you know, they fixed bayonets and, and, and charged the positions. I mean, that was, you know, that, that was massive for the, for the Scots Guards. Um, but yeah, no, it, it is, it is a, it was, it was a talking point through training. Whereas now, I, I don't think going through training, they probably would be talking more so about Afghanistan and, and Iraq. You'd think those would be the, the focal points that they would be put into for people who would understand. But yes, yeah, definitely so. And you know, I hold my, you know, um, great respect for all those those Falkland veterans, especially obviously what happened on the Sir Galahad. Um, you know, we lost a lot of men on there, uh, which is which is a great shame, really. And uh, you know, they've had to go through some difficult situations. Uh, and I think mm-hmm. at a time in life where PTSD and mental health definitely wasn't talked about. I don't, it wasn't even talked about in the early noughties. It was, you know, come on, you're the guards, keep a stiff upper lip, stop, you know, stop goofing around, stop being a girl, get on with it. And that, that was pretty much the mentality, you know. And, and I think that it's only recently in the last, I probably would say five, five maybe maybe 10 years at, at a push that things have started to come out. Five years more so, definitely, with the, with the, with the, the sort of training around mental health, it, it being put into their sort of regular mats and training, the sort of training. Um, they learn about how to deal with mental health. They've got hotlines. They've got procedures in place to talk, um, which I think is good. And don't get me wrong, not everybody likes to talk, but the option is there to talk because we all do process things differently. Some people would want to talk and talk. Some people have got the ability sometimes to self deal with it and think, right, okay, I'm going to get on with it and, and crack on. But it's nice to have those options there, Chris. But yeah, it was a tough time. I think. I think in the eighties, you know, it was a, it, it was a tough time. I think that things have slightly changed um, lately, which is a good thing as well. Yes. Tough time and shit boots. Yeah, yeah, true, true, yeah. <laughs> we had that, what do you call 58 pattern webbing or something? The, the the Second World War shit. Green stuff, yeah, the green oh, stuff. It literally took you half a day to try and put it together because it was so stubborn. And then even on your first exercise, and let's be honest, on your first exercise as a, as a recruit, you don't exactly need a lot of gear do you you know we didn't even have a weapon so we didn't even have any ammunition right and yet and yet it took about two hours cramming everything inside of everything else to try to get it in these pooches (laughs) do you say that in the army pooches or is that a marines thing pouches probably pouches yeah yeah. Yeah, we we said pooches i don't know why we said that but we but we did and um, you had to have your sex, socks in your mess tin, and 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 your something rolled up in your. It, it just didn't fit in. It was ridiculous. How the hell some of them got on down in the? I know a lot of them had Bergens, but 
I think some of them had the old large packs in in the Falklands. Um, yes, yes. I mean that's um, the Sir Galahad must be just Welsh Guards legend, isn't it? Uh, you know. Yeah, I think there is. There's always been. There's a lot of books written about, it. I haven't gone into much detail reading it all. And you know, I just think that. But that's probably could have been learned from it in some shapes or forms because you know should should it have, could it and how did it happen? There's always the hows and, and sometimes these things do happen. Um, I think that what could have been better is probably and what definitely could have been better is the aftercare. And if you speak to Simon Weston and the people who were seriously injured on there, and not just you know, but for that form sort of physical scars. You know, there's obviously as we all know as well, there's the effects of that on people that maybe had, didn't have the physical injuries but had the mental injuries from seeing. You know what happened on that ship. It must have been yeah. terrible to go through, and uh, you know it stays with them. Stays ah, them out. The horror, and, mate. Yeah, you know. the but, horror. Um, but again, from my side, I, I'm just glad that things have got better. And those veterans now, you know, there is, you know, obviously late coming or whatever it has come. There is that option potentially of, of support now. Whether it's too late for some, you know, it, it would have been, I think. But hopefully, you know, we learn from things and we learn now from future conflicts that. Um, the kit's better, and we know that. The kit's starting to get better anyway. You don't have to buy your own kit anymore. Um, but, no, the support network's there. And I think mm-hmm. that's a key in life, not just being a veteran. Um, if you're anybody is having that good support network where you can speak to someone if, if you need to. It could just be a wife. It could be one person. It doesn't have to be a massive home. I mean, I, I know thousands of people from the Veterans Awards and Force Fitness and all that, but i probably got two people that I would open up to if I needed to open up to, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that, 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 that's key, really. Did you struggle at all when you left, Sean? So um, I'm going to say I'm quite lucky. I mean, when I was in, I was a purger moaner, like you. Moan, crap, it says, rubbish. Can't believe I'm on this. And I moan. And, and I, you know, I've done Bosnia. I've done Northern Ireland a little bit. Uh, and I was quite lucky in my transition. I'm going to say I was lucky in my transition. I geared it towards management. I had my head on saying, I'm not going to be a personal trainer. I'm not going to be a physical training instructor. I've been running the gym. I mean, I'm a corporal. I've got a rank. I'm going to gear my transition to management. So I transitioned and went into sort of leisure club management. And I did got a le- I got offered a job when I left. I got offered two jobs. One was a leisure club manager for 19 and a half grand a year. Uh, and one was going to work for a company called Secure Force on 400 pound a day on the circuit. And I thought, what do I want to do? And I thought, oh, I'm still young. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to do the 19 and a half grand a year. Well, I just think it's going to give me a little bit of taste of city life in management. And I can always apply for other jobs from there. And I'm glad I did because yes, I know the circuit then, and you know it's it's great. But I think then some of the lads who've been on the, the sort of close protection circuit, for those who know what I'm talking about, out in like um, Iraq and Afghanistan, they were earning four hundred pounds a day, sort of tax free. But I just think going on that, how long would it last? I knew a few lads who lost their lives, who got injured on it as well, who were blown up. Mm. And, and I was just sort of had that job and that one year of experience on that ninety and a half grand a year sort of leisure management job. Um, Give me a really good experience in profit and loss running the budget, which I didn't know much about. I knew how to run a gym. I knew how to do fizz sessions. You know, I knew all that side of it, operational health and safety, but I didn't know really how to run a budget or how to market market the gym. So I learned that. And then within sort of a couple of years, we ended up setting sort of setting up Forces Fitness then in mm-hmm. 2007 off the back of it. And then that's how we set my, my... So it was two and a half years on City Street before I set up the, the business. And... Could you just give us a synopsis of Forces Fitness, what the, what the mandate is? Yeah, so, so Forces Fitness started off like boot camps. Everyone's seen them before. You know, the old PTI yeah. comes out, sets up a running around boot camp in the field. That's how it started off, two people in Swansea. Um, but we've changed a lot. And I think if you want to be good in business, you've got to be niche and you've got to be different. Um, we were the first boot camp company ever in Swansea to set up in 2007. Um, we had seven venues across Wales at one, one point, Wales, but we don't do that now. We do more, we work in the education sector, really, predominantly around health, well-being, team building, motivation, leadership skills. So we delivered over 650 places of education, over 45,000 learners in Wales and England. It could be delivered in both the languages of Welsh and English as well, um, which is which is another great thing. Um, and it's just, it's good. You know, it's, it's, it's what we're doing. We're going to schools and colleges, talking to them about how to live a happy, healthy sort of life. You know, talking about getting outdoors three times a week, trying to embrace the outdoors, surround yourself with good people, talking about a good diet, but then taking them through military style fitness command task challenges. So 90% of our company are all military veterans as well. Uh, we've got a great team and they just, it's nice. It's a nice job. And if we speak to any of the staff or any of the guys who work for us, they'll all say, this is the best job I've ever had. It's mm. just nice. You know, almost, I say it's like a glorified teacher 
probably gets paid more than a teacher to go into a school. Um, but you're not dealing with any of the crap of the naughty kids. Does that make sense? Because you go in, yes. the no- and the naughty kids actually, or the so-called naughty kids, sorry, they love they love what we do. They get right stuck in. They get re- they love it, and they're not a drama. No one's really ever a drama on it because of the type of training we're doing. If that makes sense, brilliant. Sean, I'm fascinated. How did the Veterans Awards come around? Thirty-five. I mean, point you back to when I was on um, in the military, and they asked me if I wanted to go on selection. Um, for the SAS Special Air Service. So that's all what stayed in my mind. I'm a big believer, like you, leave life with no regrets. You know, I want to make sure when I when I tap out, which is similar to you now, I'm happy with what I've done. If it was tomorrow, I, I you know, I, I really have done everything and I'm leaving life in a positive way. Um, so I just put it plain in my mind, could I have done it? So I looked into it and at the 36 years of age, you could go through the selection process for the, for the Special Air Service uh, with the reserves, which is called 2 1 SAS. So I was 35, and I thought, look, it's now or never. I've got to do it because otherwise, it would have played in my mind, and I'd have gone. I wish I'd have done it, and I don't. I'm not that guy. So at 35, I said to the wife, I was working for Little as a store manager and a training academy manager, working 50, 60 hours a week. Forces Fitness was set up as well, so I was running the company alongside you know, being the store manager and training academy manager for Little. So that was doing a fairly decent money. We had about five or six people working for us. And then I decided to join the reserves as well. Work didn't know about this at the time. I just sort of took leave when I needed to go and do my stuff. So 200 men started the course in Brecon. Um, you know, on, on, we know all of us on the, the hills in the Brecon Beacons in January. Loads of snow and sheep, of course. Sheep everywhere, loads of snow. So they give people a bit of an inkling. You sort of carrying a backpack, which is about 55 pounds on your back. Um, you sort of lined up in your drill square. 200 men started the course. Women couldn't attempt the course then. Um, and they just call you on the wagon. Um, you jump on the wagon, they drop you off in the middle of nowhere. They'll say, right, your next grid's here and off you go. So you're going anywhere between 35 to 65 kilometers a day across the beacons, um, you know, smashing them out with this big pack on. And I got to the last, I got to the last week. So there's 50 people left on the hills now. We lost 150 people. Uh, we lost 150 people. And we're on the last, the last week, which is test week, which is by that point now, you're sort of on your own devices. You've just got to make the times, if that makes sense, to come in. And my shins were starting to hurt. I had terrible shin splints. You were starting to hurt a lot. So I was taking loads of cocodamol, loads of ibuprofen, just to sort of get me through the day. And I got to the last day. I'm the oldest guy in the course now. I'm 35 years of age because I cut off 36. And I remember rolling out of bed, putting my feet down. And I, honestly, there was almost tears in my eyes. And there was a good lad who was, uh, was opposite me. He's badge now. And he was laughing at me, calling me granddad. He's 35, my granddad of 35. But, but he was like 23 or something. <laughs> so we were having a bit of banter. And I sort of hobbled down to scoff, have my cocoa and proof in, back on the block, a cocoa and proof in. I had loads of cocoa and It wasn't recommended, obviously. They didn't know how much I took. But I took about eight cocoa and wallet, I proof in within the space of about two hours just to just get rid of the pain. I'd done my 35K on my last March on test week and got a tick in the box. And I thought, land it. There's one more test. One more test to go with this exercise endurance. And exercise endurance is 65 kilometers. You've got to do it under, in under 21 hours. Uh, so it's nonstop. So after the six hours sort of uh, rest time, you start at midnight, tell about red, big head torch on, and, and off you go. I got about 20K into it. And I just did not feel right at all. I felt queasy. I felt a little bit sick. And I knew what had happened. I'd taken too much cocoa and too much I proof it. It's probably the codeine that was making me feel really, I just didn't, everything was slowing down. Whereas before, it was masking the pain that I was going. And I had a bit of a decision to make. And I thought, do I keep sort of taking this? Because that was the only thing that was keeping me going, was the cocoa and the ibuprofen. But I thought, I had to stop. And when I come into the checkpoint, the medic, they took my boot off. My foot was like swollen. They took their finger and put it sort of into my into my calf. And you usually, when it sort of comes back, the dent just stayed there. There was like no circulation from my calf. And it turns out that I had a stress fracture on my on my right tibia. And I failed my course. I was like forty k, forty k from the end, and I failed my course. And 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 I can remember being in the. Um, on the sort of ambulance then, because like you sort of get taken to a point, they check you over, and there was two bootnecks on there uh, with me, and there's a young lad, and he was like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I was a bit older. I said, look, mate, you're like 21 years of age. I said, you know, give it another year or two and, and, and come back. Do you know what I mean? Don't worry about it. He's like, oh, when I go back to me, because he was feeling a bit down. Well, what's going to happen when I go back to my unit, you know? And I was like, look, don't worry about it. So he picked him up a little bit, as an older pod would do. Um, and there was another guy from 2-1 and 2-3 already branched going for 2-2 selection because it's slightly different the 2-2 selection to the reserve one. Um, so there was five of us that come off that last last day on the hills. And it, it was gutted. But what I took from it was 
at least I give it a go. You know, and, I, and I'm proud to say that I left it all out there. You know, it was a medical withdrawal. I didn't quit. You know, I didn't quit. It was a medical withdrawal. I pushed my absolute limits until my body couldn't go no further. And, and, and it's a 97% fail rate. It's a tough course. And I know you've had spoken to a lot of people who have come through the selection process and that were bad special air service or, or SBS as well. And I take my hat off to anyone who's been through the process because it is such a hard course. But I take great pride in sort of getting that far and sticking my hand up and saying, do you know what, I'm going to give it a go. You know, if I was younger, maybe in my 20s, could I have done it? You probably think I probably could have if I was 35, a bit older. But they're all sort of, I still question things though, Chris. I still think, oh, if I wore different boots, would that have been all right? I and sometimes I think that thing pops in my head. It's only because I was passionate about it. But I also believe that things happen for a reason. Because off the back of that, um, I put I invested a lot of time into Forces Fitness. I left Lidl's and, and just went for Forces Fitness. I left that 50, 60 grand a year job and put all my efforts into Forces Fitness to grow that. And that business grew 700% last year. Fantastic organization. We won a few awards from Forces Fitness. And I was sat in an awards ceremony in, in central London. We got invited to it. was um, a good award ceremony. Fantastic. Actually, Andy McNabb was there speaking on that award ceremony. Lovely night. Really good. But I just thought the ticket prices were like 350 quid plus VAT for one ticket. And I, I just thought to myself, could we do something like this, community-based, home nation-based, because we have got big national awards like Soldier On Awards, Hero Preneurs. We do a good job, to be fair. They do a great job. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to make it the Welsh Veterans Awards and have that little hub in Wales and then England, and then Scotland, and obviously Northern Ireland. Um, but I wanted to do something that was all-encompassing. Covered the whole community, covered people like yourself, you know, inspiration. You covered people that are volunteering for places like, you know, SAFA and the Royal Marines Charity or, or the ABS Soldiers Charity. Giving up 50 hours a week at a time to go and help people. People who have set the breakfast hubs, you know, where, where people, veterans can come and have a bit of a chat and a brew and a bit of banter. You know, so those people. But also those companies that, you know, go above and beyond to employ and obviously those serving reservists that, that um, help and support. And the way we set it up, I, I think, from my perspective, is something I'm really proud of because all our boards do it in a voluntary capacity. Our inspiration panel do it in a voluntary capacity. There's a very small amount of money that goes to an admin salary and anything above and beyond costs gets put back into our community through a small grants scheme. So if there's a charitable organization with under £100,000 turnover, they can apply for small grants, which will help and support them. So very proud of the Veterans Awards. Obviously, I really, it's very passionate about it, but it came from Forces Fitness winning a few awards and thinking, how can we do it? But it's been so supported, so very well supported. Royal Navy, Royal Marines Charity are one of our charity partners, ABF Soldiers Charity. Um, yeah, it's just, they're just great. As you know, they're just very positive nights. People coming together to celebrate the positives. Sean, you're doing an amazing job, mate. It's been fascinating to hear about your experience and just to chat about the Welsh Guards and give them some airtime because uh, it's all about bloody paras and SAS these days, isn't it? <laughs> no disrespect, you know, our great chats with everybody, but, you know, it's nice to, to uh, spread the love a around a bit. Now I've said that, Sean, is there anything else you wanted to add that I might have forgotten? We're, we're going to put all your links below. No, I think, do you know what, throughout the conversation, Chris, I think we covered everything. I think mm. for everybody out there, you know, surround yourself with those positive people, give back and support others if you can. And for me, do something in life that makes you smile because that's the most important thing. Whether that's going out for a walk, a swim, doing stuff with your family, don't follow the crowd, do your own little thing and do something that makes you smile because we only live once, don't we? Yes. And we want it to be a happy, healthy life. So, yeah, thank you very much for having me, Chris. I really appreciate that. Oh, absolutely, mate. Listen, Sean, stay on the line so I can thank you properly when I push the button off. But uh, massive thanks, mate. Really, really thoroughly enjoyed this chat. Thank you. Thank you. To all our friends out there, big love to you as well. If you can hit the like and subscribe button, we'd really appreciate it. And um, we'll see you next time. Thank you.